Good afternoon, I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to today's show. This afternoon, well, you know, folks, I'm really lucky with a show like this. I get to speak with incredible living legends. This afternoon, Jane Goodall. But we're going to delve into different things about Jane's life that perhaps you didn't know about. For example, I'll bet you never knew what Jane Goodall believes in. Jane Goodall. Just about everywhere there is a creature, whether it's a Yeti, a Yari, a Bigfoot, an abominable snowman, a wild uh, there's creatures in South America. Everywhere there are stories. They all seem to describe much the same kind of creature. Very often there are two, one big black one and one smaller grayish one. The sounds that they're said to make are about the same. And people have come up with information not because they think you want to know, but just because they just happen to be talking about something. So there's clearly something, like whether it's a creature that's recently become extinct and needs a memory, and yet you find lots of indigenous people who come face to face with what they believe is a, is a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. This afternoon, Jane Goodall and her book, Hope for Animals and Their World, How Endangered Species Are Being Rescued from the Brink, right now on Brent Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with a living legend today, an incredible, incredible human being, Jane Goodall. Her book, Hope for Animals and Their World, readily available, chapters in to go right across the country, and as always, www.brenthollandshow.com. Click on the book cover, take you to chapters in to go online, Get this book, folks. Jane, thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy schedule. And I know how busy you are. You're in Toronto today. I was wondering if we could start off Message of Hope. And that's what this book conveys to everybody who reads it. Let's talk about turning things around and the positive inspiration that I came away with from this book. I'm glad that you say that because really the reason I wrote the book in the first place is because I find, I find as I travel around the world that so many people have lost hope. And if you lose hope, that means you don't do anything. You feel helpless and powerless. And the problems indeed around us are very great. And the further afield we look and think of global problems, the more helpless and powerless we feel. And, and yet at the same time as I'm traveling around, I meet so many extraordinary people who, who don't give up. And they are able to achieve remarkable success in saving a species from extinction and restoring an environment. And I thought, well, I need to gather these stories together and I need to give people hope especially the young people who are starting out on their lives and so often people say to them, well, you know, it's all too late, we've got climate change, etc., etc. So this book, for me, was very, very inspirational, spending time with these people. I agree completely. It is a great book, folks. We're speaking with Jane Goodall today. Really needs no introduction, does she? I just want to share something with you. We had interviewed a very famous hockey player by the name of Theo Fleury. Theo Fleury had been sexually abused when he was younger and went through some trials and tribulations and it's a story of redemption one of the things he shared with me when i asked him to share something with the audience he said don't quit before the miracle and when i read your book i thought of those words immediately what a lovely thing for him to say i must remember that don't quit before the miracle that's great it's empowering your book and it's inspiring at the same time. Let's talk about Jane Goodall's early years. Can we talk about your your years in wartime Britain and what that was like for you? It was, I think, a very, very formative part of my life because, first of all, we were rationed. You know, we were, everything was part of the war effort and we didn't take anything for granted. We always had enough to eat and we had clothes to wear. But everything other than what was really necessary was a treat. And, you know, that's lacking in so many young people today, at least in the affluent societies. So that was important. But also, I was around nine years old, something like that, a very impressionable age, when the first pictures of the Holocaust were released, all these bodies, these skeletons. and. It was a complete shock and it really 
made a deep impression on me that we can be so evil to each other. Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that suicidal tendency come from? Now, you mentioned the Holocaust, and there's no question a man's inhumanity to man. And we're continuing to do it in terms of the environment and what we're doing to our fellow animals right on this planet. Where does this suicidal tendency come from, do you think, Jane? You know what I think? Obviously, having spent all these years learning about the chimpanzees, mm -hmm. it's obvious that there isn't a sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. We're part of it. And then thinking, well, we're different in one way in that we, we have this sophisticated language. We can talk about things, plan things. We're clearly the most intellectual creature that's ever walked on this planet. So back to your question, how on earth is it then that we're destroying the only home we have? And I feel we must have lost something called wisdom, the wisdom that the indigenous people showed when they made a major decision only after asking how will this decision we make today affect our people in the future? And we're making decisions today based on how will this benefit me now, me and my family now, the next shareholders meeting, my next political campaign, my next job interview. These are the kind of criteria we're using. And that's, I think, due to a disconnect between this clever brain and the human heart. I agree completely. I think we've lost so much that the natives and the Aboriginal folks, First Nation folks, have been able to uh, hold on to themselves all through this turmoil of the past 150 years, 200 years, the Industrial Revolution. And I'm hoping that we're going to sway back to that and learn from our Aboriginal peoples. And I think they're coming to the forefront now. I see this in so many ways, especially here in Canada, that Aboriginals are coming to the forefront. They're empowering themselves again, and we're learning from them. We are finally celebrating this great, great human resource we have right here in this country. Folks, we're talking with Jane Goodall. The book is Hope for Animals and Their World, readily available chapters in to go right across the country, www.brenthollandshow.com website. Just click on the book cover, take you right to chapters in to go. You touched on chimpanzees before. I wanted to ask you a few questions about chimpanzees because I'm fascinated. Whenever I go down to the Toronto Zoo or one of the Montreal zoos or any zoo right across the country, for some reason, I always gravitate towards the baboons, the chimpanzees, the apes, etc. Do they ever look at us the way we look at them and just say to each other, did you see what that silly human just did? Isn't that crazy? Do they ever display humor? <laughs> they absolutely have a sense of humor. Whether, whether they find us particularly humorous or not, I don't know. They certainly have a sense of humor and they do watch people. I mean, I think hmm. one of the things that some zoo animals can do to alleviate the boredom. So hopefully they find us amusing. I, I don't know, but you know, I'm not too fond of zoos, and yet zoos can play a very, very important role. One, in educating children if it's a good zoo, and two, in raising awareness about the plight of the animals in other countries and other places. What makes up a good zoo? What's the criteria? A good zoo, well, well, first of all, it depends on the animal. And if it's something like elephants or chimpanzees, it needs to have space. If it's smaller creatures, the space is less important. What's important, though, for your creatures with, with uh, reasonably well-developed brains is that they, they do get bored, so they need to have a stimulating environment. They need a good social group. They need at least space to, to do their normal um, you know, locomotion activities, and but it's the it's the stimulation, the enrichment, the presenting things as puzzles rather than just food on a tray. You're listening to the Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow Dot com. Folks, we're speaking with Jane Goodall today. I want to stay on the subject of chimpanzees. Jane, for yourself, what is it you see when you look deep in their eyes? Because you're one of the few people that have been able to get up close to a chimpanzee. What is it you see when you look through their eyes? Is it a gateway, perhaps a mirror 
to our own humanity in some sense? You know, it's very strange looking into the eyes of a chimpanzee. I would give anything to be able to look out through those eyes and to see and feel what the chimpanzee is seeing and feeling when he or she is looking at me. I think that's one of the mysteries, and I love mysteries. We'll never know everything. But there's one thing for sure. When I look deep in the eyes of a chimpanzee or any other animal, um, as I say, with a reasonable, well-developed brain, I know that I'm looking into the eyes of a thinking, feeling being. That's absolutely clear. And then this leads to the whole concern about the way that we're treating so many of these amazing beings. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned was a thinking being right there. They're also a problem-solving being. Before you began your research, humanity was under the impression that what separated man from ape or man from the animals was the ability to make a tool. Not so, as you found out. I was wondering if you could tell us that story. Well, it was it came just in time, this observation. It was David Greybeard, the first chimpanzee to lose his fear of me. And I, he was, you know, I still couldn't get too close, but I saw this dark shape, and I was peering through my binoculars, and I could see that he was reaching out, picking grass stems, and using them to fish termites from their underground nest. And then breaking off a leafy twig and stripping the leaves, which is modifying, which is the beginning of tool making. And I was able to send a telegram off to Lewis Leakey, my mentor, and tell him what I'd seen. Because at that time we were actually defined as man, the tool maker, Lewis wrote back and said, now we shall have to redefine man, hmm. redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> That's perfect. That's wonderful. In fact, we're going the other way, really, aren't we? I mean, we, we do acknowledge um, that we are just the fifth great ape. Biologically, we're so like them. Let's talk about creationism. Which camp do you fall into? No, I don't think that. Well, in, in a way, you could say that's anonymous, but I certainly believe in the fact that simple life forms have evolved into complex life forms. I've been with Agreed. and old of I have picked up the, the different kinds of fossilized skeletons of, for example, horses, and you see how development takes place over the millennia. But that doesn't really answer the question of how it all began. And if you want to say it began with the Big Bang, fine, but then what led to the Big Bang? And just my brain isn't able to comprehend anything like that. So I see... You know, I feel a great spiritual power out there, which for me is is very, very helpful. It gives meaning to my life. Myself as well. Can we talk about your faith? Do you practice any organized religion, or do you have any faith or spirituality that you follow? I, I don't practice organized religion uh, anymore. I grew up as a Christian. Uh, I learned a lot about some of the other great religions. I found that they all share the same basic tenets. You know, you compare Christianity and Islam, and the golden rule is the same. Do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Don't kill, don't steal, etc. And But I've always resonated with the indigenous people's belief in the oneness of things. And I love the way... They talk about the animals as brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So did St. Francis. It used to be like that in Christianity as well. I, you know, I, I'm puzzled. I go back to that suicidal thing. I don't know where we got off track or how we got off track. Uh, it seems to me for years we had to live in tandem with nature. And somehow we got off that track. Folks, of course, we're speaking with Jane Goodall today. Her book, Hope for Animals and Their World, readily available for you at Chapters Indigo. Or if you don't want to go out from the comfort of your own home, just click on the book cover at www.brenthollandshow.com. Take you right to Chapters Indigo. Also, I'm going to put a link up there for, um, as you'll see, folks, right to her um, Jane Goodall Institute right here in Canada. Make a donation. I mean, this is essential work uh, that the Institute is is doing. It's virtually keeping us alive. It's finding ways that we can uh, institute change and serious change and things that are going to help sustain us. I'd like to go back to chimpanzees again because I'm just, as I said, amazed with these guys. Gender differences. 
I was just reading uh, a few days ago that on your website, by the way, folks, a wealth of information there. Their culture is driven by women. <laughs> well, it's the females that raise the young. It's the females who provide the role models in lots of ways because childhood is long and the child stays with the mother for the first five days. It's the females who may grow up and move out into neighboring um, social groups and take their culture with them. So if there's a, a certain kind of tool use in one community and hasn't yet arrived in the neighboring community, the female may actually transfer that culture with her when she moves. So the, the females play an important role in, in raising the young and maintaining culture, but the males too, that their role is to patrol the boundaries of the territory and protect the resources for their own females and young. What are the inherent dangers for chimpanzees? Other than us, we're the danger. It's, hmm. uh, it's uh, human population growth and habitat destruction. It's uh, hunting for food, not subsistence hunting. That doesn't have much impact. It's the commercial bushmeat trade. That's the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. And that's made possible by foreign logging companies moving deep into the heart of previously pristine forests and making way for hunters with modern um, weapons. It's devastating. All of the Congo Basin, the last great populations of chimps, gorillas. I'm glad you mentioned bushmeat. It was on my list of questions and notes I have. In the early years, you waited tables. You had a goal in mind. You went out there and made it happen yourself. What was that like for you, waiting tables, knowing that you wanted not to be there, but to be in Africa, doing what well, you're doing now? It wasn't quite like that. The way it was, was as a child, I was fascinated by animals like lots of kids. I had an amazing mother, and she would, when everybody laughed at me and said, you'll never get to Africa, because that was my dream. I wanted to live with animals and write books about them. And she would say, if you really want something and you work hard and you never give up, you will find a way. And so uh, we couldn't afford university. So I did a secretarial course. And then came the breakthrough. I got invited by a school friend to Kenya. So to raise the money, I worked as a waitress. It was a step towards a goal. And when I'd finally saved up my wages and tipped to the tune of a return fare by boat, off I went, and then I met the late Lewis Leakey, and he offered me this extraordinary opportunity for a young, untrained girl with no PhD straight from England, not even any degree at all. Pretty amazing. Well, you're pretty amazing. <laughs> Let's face it, you're just an amazing person. You're an amazing woman. Uh, you just do it. You just go out there and do it and make it happen for yourselves. And folks, those of you listening right now in universities, there's no reason to think why you couldn't do the same thing. Pick up that torch and carry it forward without question. Let's talk about Bigfoot. Do you think that this creature actually exists? Is it uh, some type of ape that we haven't discovered yet? Well, you know what's fascinating? I mean, I've been interested in this and just about everywhere. There is a creature, whether it's a Yeti, a Yari, a Bigfoot, an abominable snowman, a wild bird, there's creatures in South America. Everywhere there are stories. They all seem to describe much the same kind of creature. Very often there are two, one big black one and one smaller grayish one. The sounds that they're said to make are about the same. And people have come up with information not because they think you want to know, but just because they just happen to be talking about something. So there's clearly something, like whether it's a creature that's recently become extinct and needs a memory, and yet you find lots of indigenous people who come face to face with what they believe is a is a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. You know, I agree with you because uh, in the oral traditions of Aboriginal folks, as you say, uh, from, from continent to continent, there's a lot of similarities there. I actually do another show called Night Fright, where we discuss mm, conspiratorial aspects of things. And also, that's not what this show is, by the way, Jane. I just want to let you know. But one of the one of the th subjects we touch on, of course, is Bigfoot, because we look at uh, the mysteries of the world, if you will. There seems to be so much uh, oral tradition 
of um, sightings of Bigfoot and Sasquatch that come down through the First Nations folks and drawings as well. It's amazing. You know, I was in Ecuador and this, these were a group of people who are miles from anywhere, no roads, no nothing. And they, they communicate with each other by having like the old traveling minstrel. They have a hunter go from village to village. So with my translator, I asked them to ask these hunters if they ever found a monkey without a tail. That's all I said, a monkey without a tail. Nothing about size or anything. And three of them came back and said, oh yes, um, the people in these villages uh, say that there's a six foot monkey that walks upright and doesn't have a tail. And that's in the middle of Ecuador. Oh, I just got goosebumps when you said that. That's incredible. It is, and I just wish that I could have money to, to go and follow it up, but you know. Let me plug your website right away. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, Jane Goodall, I'm going to put that link right up on the www.brenthollandshow.com website. Go make a donation. Uh, if anybody's going to find Bigfoot and unleash that mystery, it's going to be Jane Goodall, who we're speaking with this afternoon. Her book, of course, Hope for Animals and Their World. A couple of more questions about chimpanzees, then I'll let you go. Jane Goodall, folks, just for you that are unaware, was the only human being ever accepted into, do they call them clans? Is it a clan, Jane? Community. Community. Thank you. I apologize for that. Community of chimpanzees. She was accepted, the only human being. Did you ever introduce something non-Indigenous into their diet to see how they would react? Uh, no. In fact, it, me having a camp there, there was food that they didn't know about all, all over the place. Well, no, you know, we had to keep it hidden away. But And it was very interesting. The baboons that lived there, they immediately would take any of our food, and if it was edible, they would eat it. Whereas the chimpanzees, uh, sometimes an infant would pick up a strange piece of, like once a little cookie, and the elder sister immediately, with great horror, brushed it away. And I've seen that um, on other occasions when an infant picks something that isn't part of the feeding tradition of the, of the community, then it gets taken away. That's amazing. Yes, they're strict with their, with their feeding tradition. Very disciplined. You're listening to The Brent Holland Show. For more information on today's guests, as well as free podcasts and downloads, please go to the www.brenthollandshow.com website. www.brenthollandshow.com Do they ever show any signs of creativity, either even simple uh, amounts of creativity as some form of um, culture, if you will, drawing in the sand perhaps, something as basic as that? I wish. I just have one young chimpanzee who drew two lines in the sand. I thought, ah, this is going to be it. But that was it. That was all he did. Mm. And I think the creativity comes in, if you watch a young one playing, my goodness, they are endlessly creative. And they will take a little stick and play with a trail of ants and then watch them seemingly with absolute fascination how you disturb a trail of ants and they go all, all, all running around in different directions. Um, so they do uh, invent in their play and I think that leads to new tool use because if they invent something adaptive then others will imitate. Interesting, interesting. Jane, what makes you angry? What really gets you red in the face and, and pissed off. Well, what makes me angry is cruelty. And whether it's cruelty to, to animals or whether it's cruelty to each other, I just find cruelty and things like deliberate torture has kept me awake sometimes. I find it so hard to understand and I think sometimes it's done through a lack of understanding. I don't know, but I, it, it really upsets me a lot. Thank you for that. Folks, we're speaking with Jane Goodall today. Hope for Animals and Their World is her book. And just go to www.brenthollandshow.com website. Click on the book cover. Take you right to Chapters Indigo. Order this book, folks. Also, click on the other link that takes you to her website and make a donation. It is essential. Jane, we're going to have to start to wrap up now, but I have one final question that I always ask all my guests who come on the show. And that question is, you're virtually, this show is syndicated throughout the university slash community radio network from coast to coast to coast, the three coasts here in Canada. It's around 80 stations. You're virtually speaking to every university student and international student across the country. What would you say to them? 
All right, I'm going to say two things. One, please check out our Roots and Shoots program because every student will absolutely find something there, rootsandshoots.org. That's one. But the second and really important message I have for every single one of you is that just remember every single day that you live, you make an impact on the world around you and you have a choice as to what it sort of impact you're going to make. And if you would just spend a few minutes thinking about the consequences of the choices you make each day, what you eat, what you wear, how you get from A to B, how you interact with people and animals, then you probably find you are making small changes and both basically to the bigger changes that as a society we must have if we care about our own children and grandchildren. That's beautiful. Folks, Jane Goodall. Jane, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're doing press all day and it must be crazy for you and I do appreciate it and I'm sure all our listeners do as well from coast to coast to coast. I've enjoyed talking to you and uh, hopefully the listeners have enjoyed listening to us. I'm sure they have. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you again in Sudbury when you come up. Absolutely. Bye. Bye now. I want to thank Jane Goodall for coming on the show this afternoon and telling us all about her book, Hope for Animals and Their World. Thank you all for listening. I'm Brent Holland. See you next time. (laughs) 